Now we'll be looking at um, complications of diabetes, both acute and chronic. And some of these are associated with type 1, some with type 2. So I will explain to you as we go along. So if you look at complications, we can divide them into two major categories, acute and chronic. Acute complications are hypoglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, and hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. The first one, hypoglycemia, is most commonly a complication of treatment. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a complication seen in type 1 diabetic patients. And hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state is seen with type 2 diabetes. And then we have these chronic complications which are associated with both types of diabetes. All right. Now let's look at hypoglycemia first, also called hypoglycemic shock. Now when there is excess insulin beyond what is required, it will move glucose into the cells and hypoglycemia can result. When there is hypoglycemia, remember um, when we were talking about blood glucose levels, in hypoglycemia, you have release of glucagon and you have activation of the uh, adrenal medulla. So you have release of adrenaline. There is also activation of sympathetic nervous system. It will cause tachycardia, tremors, uh, there is weakness, there is confusion, there is pallor, they could be sweating, okay? In order to maintain blood glucose levels, liver will break down glycogen, there will be gluconeogenesis, so you're trying to make new glucose and uh, put it into the blood. So again, you know, when you have, but you are unable to maintain blood glucose levels, the brain will suffer. So if the blood glucose levels decrease further, the neurons cannot function, leading to coma and death. So if there is hypoglycemia, the earliest signs could be just feeling of weakness, confusion, a bit of tachycardia, tremors. So diabetic patients should be taught about these warning signs. If they don't bring their blood glucose level up, and these warning signs appear within few minutes, they could end up having uh, neuronal dysfunction leading to coma and death. Now, the other side of the spectrum, uh, the other acute complication is diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, what's happening here that uh, due to decreased insulin secretion or increased insulin resistance, but as I told you, this, this complication is more common in type 1 diabetics. Okay, so it's basically decreased insulin secretion. Glucose doesn't enter the cells, it remains in the blood. This causes hyperglycemia, right? So high blood glucose levels, and it causes glycosuria. So you will have glucose appearing in the urine. When glucose is appearing in the urine, okay, it takes water with it. Glucose is water loving. So when glucose is going out in the urine, it takes water with it. So these patients will actually be dehydrated because they're losing more water. That's why they have polydipsia. They drink more water because they're losing a lot of water through the kidneys. At the same time, because glucose is not entering into the cells so they start breaking down glycogen or they start making glucose from uh, non-carbohydrate sources gluconeogenesis and some of this glucose can also spill out and contribute to hyperglycemia so this is what is happening in terms of glucose in these patients now this glucose as i told you it causes polyuria so osmotic diuresis and this is causing some dehydration at the same time, you're losing electrolytes in the urine, more electrolytes than usual. So it could also lead to some electrolyte imbalance. Now, when this is happening and cells are unable to use glucose for their metabolic needs, they will have to switch to lipids. When they start using lipids, 
ketone bodies are formed as a result. Okay, so lipolysis uh, for energy purposes leads to formation of ketone bodies. Now these ketone bodies are very acidic, so they cause what is known as ketoacidosis. So blood pH will drop. Also, these ketone bodies will start appearing in the urine, ketonuria. So these people who are having diabetic ketoacidosis, they are dehydrated, number one, and they are having acidosis. So two major features of this complication is acidosis and dehydration. Now there is a second type of acute complication, but this one develops in type 2 diabetics. Similar to diabetic ketoacidosis, but different. I'll tell you how it is different. Now, this is uncommon, but it can develop in type 2 diabetes, and it has a high mortality, 15% mortality, if it is not managed immediately. Now, this is similar to DK, as both are characterized by hyperglycemia, that is common, but in hyperglycemic, hyper or smaller state, there is insulin is still there, right? The problem is insulin resistance. Insulin is still there. So this insulin prevents breakdown of fat stores for production of glucose, and therefore ketoacidosis is avoided. So the main feature in this complication would be dehydration. All right, so this is a medical emergency. It can lead to drowsiness, stupor, coma, and death. Treatment mandates aggressive fluid electrolyte resuscitation and strict control of serum glucose levels. Chronic complications are many. So diabetes can affect virtually every organ in the body. So let's start from the top. Uh, can cause stroke by predisposing these people to atherosclerosis. In the eyes, it can lead to cataract or retinopathy. Okay. In the heart, because of atherosclerosis, can lead to myocardial infarction. Uh, kidneys, there is nephropathy. There is also increased risk of kidney infection or pyelonephritis. Neuropathy, so it um, affects the neurons. It can cause impotence, infertility, urinary incontinence, autonomic neuropathy. It can also cause peripheral neuropathy. So these patients will have numbness over their fingers or toes. Also weakness in advanced cases. Also, there is increased risk of peripheral vascular disease. There could be ulcers and usually on their feet or under their feet, there is delayed healing and it could lead to development of gangrene. Okay, this is called diabetic foot. Let's look at cardiovascular disease. In these patients with type 2 diabetes mainly, dyslipidemia is common, uh, which means that there is elevated triglycerides and LDL. So when there is high LDL, it predisposes to atherosclerosis, hypertension, and stroke is much more common in those with diabetes than in the non-diabetic population because of this. So if you look here, hyperglycemia predisposes to endothelial dysfunction. Inflammatory cytokines which are released can also cause endothelial dysfunction. And if you remember, endothelial dysfunction is the first step in the development of atherosclerosis. Endothelial dysfunction causes expression of adhesion molecules, which causes adhesion of macrophages. And at the same time, if you have LDL, it will get oxidized and these macrophages will phagocytose this oxidized LDL and they will become foam cells. Remember? Okay. So if you see here, this whole process of atherosclerosis can be started by hyperglycemia by causing endothelial dysfunction and also by hypoinsulinemia. Okay. So these both can cause endothelial dysfunction. Uh, one of the complications of diabetes is diabetic retinopathy. So if you look at the retina using an ophthalmoscope, uh, normally it will appear like this. So you have blood vessels which are coming out of the optic disc and supplying the retina. And you have the fovea and macula 
over here, the area where you have maximum visual acuity. And from where these blood vessels are coming out, this is the, uh, the blind spot, yeah? If you look at a, a retina uh, which is affected by diabetes, then you'll see, you can see hemorrhages, small hemorrhages. And then you see what is known as cotton wool spots. So fade areas. You can also see exudate and you see abnormal growth of blood vessels, neovascularization, abnormal blood vessels. So this is what diabetic retinopathy would look like. Okay. And this is one of the common tests that you will do patients with diabetes. Whenever they visit, you look at their retina to make sure the complications are not developing. Then there is diabetic nephropathy. The kidneys can be affected, leading to gradual loss of kidney function, shrinkage of the kidney, and there is also a risk of kidney infections or pyelonephritis. There is diabetic neuropathy. Okay, It could be autonomic. It could affect autonomic function. For example, they can develop postural hypotension and other autonomic abnormalities. Peripheral neuropathy can present as feelings of pins and needles, paresthesias or numbness over their fingers and toes. Diabetic foot is common, but it's, it's a, it's a long-term complication. The problem with diabetic foot is that um, it's a, it's a multi-step process. There is involvement of peripheral neuropathy and vasculopathy. So if I explain to you here, in diabetes, you have vasculopathy or angiopathy, so affecting the blood vessels. So angiopathy and neuropathy. In angiopathy, there are two types of effects on the blood vessels, macrovascular and microvascular. Macrovascular is the atherosclerosis that we discussed earlier. So these people are prone to develop atherosclerosis, which can cause thrombosis, and if it happens in a blood vessel in the lower limb, it can cause blockage of the blood flow leading to gangrene, okay? Uh, this is the macrovascular complication. The microvascular one is that the smaller blood vessels are affected. So there is hypoperfusion. Not enough blood is supplied to the skin and the peripheral tissues. So there could be skin atrophy. Skin atrophy leads to local ulceration, most commonly under the feet. So in the sole of the feet, you can have development of ulceration. Trauma can make the situation worse. So if these people have trauma under the feet, it will cause a wound, which will be because of hypoperfusion, the healing is affected. So it doesn't heal that well. So this is due to the angiopathy. And when there is ulceration, there is increased risk of infection. Okay. And because there is hypoperfusion, you don't have enough blood flow. You don't have a good inflammatory reaction there. So the bacteria can grow easily. They have now on top of it, you have neuropathy. Neuropathy means there could be sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy, or autonomic neuropathy. Autonomic neuropathy leads to decreased sweating which causes dry skin and dry skin is more prone to develop ulcers and infections. At the same time, when you have motor uh, neuropathy, there is muscle atrophy. There could be abnormalities of gait leading to pressure points under the feet, again, predisposing to ulceration. With sensory neuropathy, there is loss of pain sensation. So these people will not feel pain when they get hurt under the feet. So if you look at all these factors now, all of them coming together, the ulceration that develops under the feet in diabetic patients, you know, lead to infection. And if this infection gets into the soft tissue, spreads, then it could lead to gangrene. That's all for diabetes.